All right. <clears throat> there we go. All right. If we can turn in our Bibles, please, to uh, the book of Ruth and chapter two. And we're going to begin reading in verse 13 to the end of the chapter. We're still considering uh, the idea of the field of Boaz and Ruth's experience in the field of Boaz. So it says in verse 13, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded the, his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us and one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. And again, God will bless that reading of his word. And again, just to add uh, one more scripture that we want to keep in the mix in our thinking, and that is uh, we looked at last time, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, where uh, the Apostle Paul is speaking of the assembly, and he, he talks about it in different ways. He says, we're laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry or God's cultivated field. You are God's building. And of course, it likens the local assembly to both a building and a cultivated field, and particularly a cultivated field in a sense that a place where fruit for God is produced. So that certainly needs to be kept in our mind as we've been looking at this experience of her in the field of Boaz. Uh, we've considered uh, kind of a, by way of application uh, the joys of being in God's assembly and some of the encouragements that we receive when we're in the assembly, the field of Boaz, Boaz being a type of Christ. So this is uh, Christ's special uh, place uh, where he has chosen to place his name, where we come and gather and find encouragement. So we, we want to stick to the main line of the story, but we want to give good application as we go. So that's our plan. So in verse 13, it says, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight. And again, we've already seen that uh, she, she has um, already experienced great uh, grace in her experience with Boaz. Um, uh, she, she prayed before she went to the field, speaking to a um, mother-in-law, 
uh, she, she says in verse two, uh, she wanted to go and glean. Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I might find grace. And of course, she didn't know which field she was going to end in, but she ended up in a field where she did indeed find much grace. And so she acknowledges in verse 10, then shall she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And so she recognized that she had been given much grace uh, by, being, by, by being allowed to glean in this field. But then verse 13, as she speaks to Boaz, she says, let me find favor in thy sight. She's asking for more grace. And it's wonderful. We often uh, think of the scripture, he giveth more grace. And uh, how wonderful it is to be recipients of divine grace. We, we're, we're all recipients of grace, but there's times in our lives where we need even more grace and grace upon grace. And, and wonderful that his, his grace is never exhausted. It's exhaustless, the grace of God, uh, as it reaches out uh, to strangers like us. And so she appreciates the value of the grace she's received, but she's now asking for more. And in, in this verse 13, we get a little bit, first real glimpse of uh, her hidden sorrows. Up to now, but we haven't heard much about that. There's very little uh, about what she's gone through. Uh, we, we've, we've heard about it, but we're not hearing it from her. And verse 13, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. And so thou hast comforted me, thou hast consoled me, uh, is the idea. Uh, she, and uh, also the fact that this idea is spoken friendly, I'm told it, it has the idea of spoken to the heart. And so in a very real sense, she had been consoled, she'd been comforted, by Boaz, and he had spoken to the heart of thine handmaid. And so we, we get some hint of her many sorrows that she's gone through. She's lost her husband. She's left her family. She's left her homeland. She's left everything uh, to, to go uh, with Naomi. And it hasn't been easy. There's a lot of sorrows. And yet she finds that uh, her experience in the field of Boaz it was a place where she received from him consolation, comfort, and encouragement. And of course, we, we need to see in terms of the local assembly that it is a place where God's people can go uh, with all the trials and difficulties of life and find that word of consolation, that word of comfort, that word of encouragement. And of course, where do we get that from? Well, it, the scriptures give us hope, don't they? We, they give us comfort. They give us consolation. And so we can receive encouragement from the Lord uh, when we go to the local assembly. And so that's been her experience. And she entreats his favor, calling herself his handmaid. And again, we see something of the humility of this woman. Uh, she, she realizes that uh, she, she doesn't have really any claim uh, upon him as far as she's aware. She's a stranger. And she, she's just a servant. She's a, she's a handmaid. And, and she, she even compares herself. Uh, and she says, uh, she's just thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. She recognized she was different. She recognized that she wasn't like the rest, right? She, she's, she's from Moab. She's different. Uh, she's, she's a stranger. And yet he has taken notice of her. He has shown her comfort and consolation. Uh, this alien, this stranger, and uh, has been taken in. And we see that in scripture of people like that, the Shulamite. Uh, she, again, she, she in, in the Song of Solomon, uh, she, she, she kind of kept referring to the fact that she's black and ruddy and she's not like everybody else. And she's amazed that, that he would take any interest in her. And certainly uh, the woman from Shunem in Solomon's court, again, she, she feels like, well, what do I have? Uh, but nevertheless, uh, here we are, uh, we're strangers, we once were afar off, uh, we've been brought into the field of Boaz, and we've received great comfort, and great grace, and great 
encouragement from him. And so it's a lovely verse, verse 13. Uh, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for thou for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And again, there's this sense that she can't get over how kind God has been uh, in the, in the sense in Boaz's treatment of her. And certainly she has this uh, spirit of humility, uh, spirit of gratitude. It's all seen in her. And, and certainly uh, she she would speak to us of one who Peter speaks about in First Peter three four about this this woman who has the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's a that's a clear description of of how we would see Ruth. That's how she is. She's just delightful, and you know it's interesting that humility is always the place of blessing in a sense. If we can get to that place. Uh, you know, he gives more grace, but who does he give it to? It's to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He gives more grace. And yet our flesh resists taking that lowly place every step of the way. Isn't it amazing? But if we can get to that place of humility in his presence, the Lord can just pour out his abundant grace, grace upon grace upon us. And so certainly that is her experience. She calls him my Lord. Uh, again, just her humility. She sees herself just as a simple handmaiden and a recipient of grace. And do we? is that how we see ourselves? Uh, he is our Lord. And here we are. We're, we're, we're just humble servants and we're recipients of divine grace. And we, we just are very grateful for all that he has done for us. That should be our attitude. And we certainly see that. Seeing thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaiden. And again, we might ask ourselves, uh, when strangers come to our gatherings, how do we treat them? Do we encourage them? Uh, do we speak friendly unto them? Uh, sometimes I, I feel that in, in a, a assemblies, uh, sometimes you can go in there and you can feel the coldness and a frostiness and you feel like you're not welcome and, and you're kept at arm's length. Uh, but in the field of Boaz, it shouldn't be like that. It should be a place where we can go and be spoken friendly to, uh, can be encouraged, uh, can be encouraged in our pilgrim pathway. And so we, we need to be conscious. And even in our meeting, conscious of strangers that come in, uh, let's go up. And I remember one time, this is a true story. I was in an assembly and we'd been asked to take a guy uh, from a local rescue mission uh, who had some kind of connection with assemblies in the past. And so we picked this guy up at the rescue mission. He'd fallen on hard times and uh, we took him to the meeting and there wasn't a single soul spoke to this man the whole evening and we just we felt so embarrassed for for this man that here he was a stranger nobody spoke friendly to him they just ignored him and i don't know whether it was because of his uh condition in life his poor state or whatever but oh how we need to be sure that in 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 the the the, the field of boaz that people get a warm and friendly reception and that we can speak encouragement to them. And certainly that should be the way it is. Notice too in verse 14, it says, And Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. And so, it's also a place where she was fed. Uh, yes, she's she's certainly been involved in in reaping, but uh, now there he invites her to sit with the reapers at mealtime, and obviously close enough to him that he's able to reach over and give her personally some parched corn. And so she's he must have deliberately seated her close to him. And so, isn't it amazing? Again, we see the condescension. He's the man, he's the owner of the field. And yet, here he is uh, eating with his workers, um, not uh, aloof and 
sitting separate from them and reaching out and passing food even to Ruth. And there's, there's, the idea is there's intimacy at his table. Uh, here he is sat with his own at his table, enjoying intimacy with them. And it's a wonderful thing. And again, we see something of that, don't we, in David? Remember Mephibosheth, uh, he invited him to sit at his table every single day, once an enemy, uh, connected with a, a hostile enemy in the past, and yet he shows kindness to him and brings him and sits him at, at his table. And isn't it a wonderful thing for us that we actually can come and sit at his table, once aliens, once enemies, and we can come uh, into the field of Boaz and be fed at his table as well. And so Ruth was to feel free to take of the bread, to dip a morsel in the, the vinegar. Uh, that word in Hebrew uh, would kind of like a sauce, a sour beverage composed of vinegar, probably wine vinegar, sour wine mixed with oil. And it was a very refreshing uh, kind of thing to dip your morsel in this and, and eat it. It kind of made the bread a little bit more soft and, and enjoyable. And so that was what was provided. It was a, it was a favorite kind of delicacy in the in the East. And that kind of similar, similar thing to kind of our, uh, like our chutneys or that kind of thing that you would, you would or some kind of dipping sauce. And so uh, Ruth ate and not only was satisfied herself, but she actually uh, was even able to take some back with her uh, for uh, Naomi, because notice it says the end of verse 14, she did eat and was sufficed and then left. And verse 18, it tells us uh, she took up it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what, what she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And so it would seem that she she ate, but she had some left over, and she she took she took a, a box back uh, for the mother in law. She 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 took a, a, a box of the leftover uh, to share with her mother in law. And isn't it good sometimes when we have fed ourselves from the Lord, we've received something that we we pass something on of the blessing to someone else. And I was just preaching the other night about, uh, uh, you know, that when we, when we hear the word of God, if we keep it to ourselves, there's a tendency to forget it. But if we can somehow pass on the blessing to someone else, if we can share with someone else, it tends to stick with us. Uh, it's, it's a great thing to do. And uh, we, we need to be sure that when we have received some good thing from the Lord, that we pass it on to others and share it with others. And so we see again, the selflessness of this girl uh, that <clears throat> she not only uh, ate herself, but she was thinking of a mother-in-law at the same time. And again, we need to be those that constantly are thinking about others. How can we pass a blessing on to someone else? And so that's Naomi was also very much in her, in her thoughts. And she, she wanted her to share in the bounty of Boaz, wanted her to experience some of the bounty of, of Boaz. And, and so, certainly it's a lovely picture of Christian fellowship and, and privilege. Those that are near to Christ and enjoying his presence, enjoying good things at his hand, want to pass on something of that blessing to others. And so certainly... Uh, this is what happens. And again, as we make this parallel with the local assembly, it should be a place where we come and get fed and are nourished and are satisfied uh, that when we come, uh, as it were, to the field of Boaz, that we, that we go away fed and satisfied. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing for saints to come to the meeting and go away empty. Uh, go away with, without anything to uh, sustain them, as it were, as they go back into the fields to labor. Uh, they need something to, to work on. Uh, and so, uh, of course, she's going to go back and labor in the field uh, after this meal. And so she needs something that will keep her going, that will give her strength uh, for, uh, for the reaping. And certainly, 
the local assembly should be a place where we come in, we're edified, uh, we're well fed, and we're strengthened to go about reaping in the whitened harvest. And so certainly she had enough and she was sufficed uh, and even had enough to pass on uh, to her mother-in-law. And so it says she did eat and was sufficed and left. She didn't tarry her around there a long time. She, she, she went out and went back to the task that had been given to her. And so verse 15, it says, when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. So having spent time with him uh, and, and in his presence and being fed by him, it's time to go back to the harvest field. And she goes back to the harvest field and she, she does it until even. Uh, so it's a, a long day in the field. Look at verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until even. And of course, we recognize that we need to go out in the fields because the night comes when no one can work, right? John's gospel, chapter nine and verse four. And so uh, there's a time to be in the harvest field. And yet there's a time coming when we won't be able to work anymore. And so <clears throat> here she is, uh, she's uh, re receiving from him. Now notice there's, a, there's been an advancement here in her experience. She, in verse nine, if you look back to verse nine, it says, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? So initially she's following after, and, and that would be the pattern. First of all, the young men uh, would go and cut down the sheaves and then the women would follow behind and they would bind up the sheaves that had been cut down and then finally the the gleaners would come last of all in this process so there's a definite process of attack uh, the men first and then the maidens would come they would bind up the sheaves and last of all coming behind would be the gleaners mopping up any leftovers uh, that had been missed, and that's, that's what they were entitled to. So she starts off, she's following after them. But now there's a massive change taking place in verse 15. When she was risen up to, the, to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves. So she's right up there in the front of the procession, as it were. She's given an advantageous place, a, a place of great privilege where she can glean from the bundles that um, were, were there right at the, uh, the, at the forefront of the field. And so she's made progress. And it's interesting too, isn't it, when somebody comes into an assembly, uh, initially uh, there's, there's this kind of reticence there, uh, they're, they're just there, they're glad to be there, but as time goes on, they see their place and see their role and begin to advance in the things of Christ and begin to take a more prominent place as time goes on. And there always should be that uh, advancement. And so certainly here she is advancing in the field of Boaz. She's moving up, as it were. And then notice too, uh, again in verse 16, let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So <laughs> we see here that Boaz really wants to bless Ruth, but he didn't want to dishonor her dignity by making her feel like she's a charity case. So he instructs his men to, to leave her some, some grain to fall purposely, supposedly by accident, but they were doing it on purpose so that she could pick it up. It's true so too, though, isn't it, that sometimes... In when we go into the assembly, the Lord has handfuls on purpose just for us. I don't know if you've ever been to a meeting and maybe you were discouraged and downhearted and maybe you were going through some struggles and somebody had a word and, and you just sensed, Lord, that was just for me. You, you just, you knew what I needed 
and you ministered to me exactly what I needed that day. Uh, it, it's a wonderful experience when that happens. Sometimes uh, in preaching, uh, there's been times in my life where I've preached and I felt no liberty, no freedom, felt like I was swimming in molasses, was ready to quit saying, I'll never preach again. I'm done. I'm finished. And somebody would come up afterwards and say, you know, what you shared this morning was just for me. <laughs> and here am I feeling kind of miserable. And yet somehow the Lord had allowed uh, handfuls on purpose to be given to a certain person that just needed to hear that message. And so certainly <clears throat> we, we need to recognize here that in this field, uh, Boaz wants to bless. Uh, she She's going to go away totally blessed and and that's the, certainly the lord wants to bless when we come together uh, we, we it's for profit he wants us to come together for profit uh, that that there'll be blessing and that people will hear handfuls on purpose messages just for them just suited to their particular need at that moment in time and uh, what a wonderful thing it is when that happens and so it says so she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And so we see something of the abundance of the field compared to the beginning of the book where uh, they're impoverished, they, they're, they're in a famine condition, and now she's experiencing fullness. Uh, she's experiencing plenty. Uh, this, this amount that she describes as an ephah, uh, different ones have different takes on what this was, but uh, the general consensus is it was about five and a half gallon tubs worth of, <clears throat> or 22 liters worth of barley. Uh, a wonderful day's work, and that would support two women for some five or six days. And so she really went away with a week's worth of food for her and her mother-in-law and so again just the abundance of the field and, and again it's a, it, it is a place of abundance of his fullness have we all received and grace upon grace uh, it's a place where we go and we get and we get abundance and we 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 can often sing we sing it in sunday school our cup is full and running over right it's a place of abundance and sometimes we go we just come away if we've heard some thoughts about Christ and and our, uh, we're just full, we're just our hearts are just thrilled. We've been, as we've been studying here the offerings and uh, just <clears throat> the the lovely pictures of the person and work of Christ and and we're already some of us are ready to go home. We've got a whole, a whole day and a half left, but what we've heard we, we just we're full. We're ready to walk. So I'm, I've got what I need. I'm ready to go home and and go back into the to the field so to speak. But it's a wonderful thing to get these things. And so this lady, she comes away with abundance. In verse 18, she says she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. So she takes her abundance to a mother-in-law. And you could just imagine a mother-in-law wondering all the time, how is she getting on? Did she find a field where she would get uh, find grace, how did things work out? And when she comes back with this abundant amount, uh, you can see, imagine uh, <clears throat> Naomi's thoughts as she sees all this, and even the fact that she'd been personally fed by the owner of the field and had enough to even pass on to a mother-in-law. And so <clears throat> her mother-in-law's response in verse 19, her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? Where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. So this is, <clears throat> we might call it the acquaintance in the field. We learn who this person was. And it's Boaz and we're going to see he's the kinsman redeemer. And that's the message that is going to be conveyed now to Naomi when she hears that it's Boaz. So there's an element of both surprise and gratitude in the language of the older woman. 
She guessed from the abundance uh, of the, the grain that had been brought home. And certainly she could see, I'm sure, the joy in Ruth's face uh, that it had been a wonderful experience and the gleaning had been done in a field of a particularly friendly and gracious owner. And so her gratitude is deepened even more when she learns where all this had happened. The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz, Ruth declares. Not yet in full realization of all the implications of this, but Naomi will explain the significance of it. And so in verse 20, it says, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. Is this the same woman who came into town saying, <clears throat> Call me Mara, <laughs> bitter? for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Is this the same woman who once said, the Lord has afflicted me? In Ruth 1, verses 20 and 21. Of course it is. But now she is beginning to see something of God's unfolding providence. She's beginning to see better the truth that we all know well that all things work together for good for those that love God, for those that are called according to his purpose. And it is interesting, isn't it, that sometimes when we, we go through uh, loss and disappointment and difficulties, and we're, we're very much like Naomi, uh, it seems like the Lord has afflicted me. And we feel the burden and the weight of all of this. And then as time goes on, we see something of his unfolding providence. And we, our, our sorrow and sadness is turned into praise and to rejoicing. And certainly we see here that there's a significant shift in her thinking. And the reason of the shift is she's come to understand the wonder of divine providence. She says, this man is a near kinsman. Literally, the man is our relative and one of our redeemers, one of our potential redeemers, right? One that has uh, the ability to redeem us, the kinsman redeemer, the goel. One of our redeemers on whom it devolves to protect us to purchase our lands, to marry you, the widow of his next kinsman. Actually, strictly speaking, it should have been Naomi that he married. <laughs> but perhaps because Naomi realized that she was past the age of bearing, uh, that it would be a better thing for Ruth uh, to marry this redeemer. She said <clears throat> that he's one of them, one of these redeemers. The, the near kinsman is a kin unto us, one of our next of kin. There's obviously uh, another relation that's closer, but <clears throat> and would have precedence in the case. And we're going to see that in the next chapter. Uh, but Naomi was filled with thankfulness to Jehovah for bringing uh, Ruth into contact with this kinsman redeemer. And so it says, and Ruth the Moabite has said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. So again, this idea that he, he told that you, you stay with me, you stay under my protection, you stay in my fields uh, until the harvest is finished, not just the barley harvest, but also the wheat harvest. And stay with me through the whole time. And so Naomi again responds, and she says to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, 
it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. It was good she should do as Boaz had said and work only in his field among faithful laborers. <clears throat> and again, for ourselves, we need to stay in the field of Boaz. There's times when it looks attractive in other places, but this is the place that God wants us to be. And we need to stay put. We need to stay and serve, and we need to trust and a place where the Lordship of Christ is owned, where the authority of his word is given its rightful place. That's where we need to stay, not to go into another field. Even though the temptations can be great sometimes, there's always a compromise involved in going to another field. Stay in that field. Work in that field. And it's good to do this, to, uh, to stay under the place where Christ has chosen to place his name and not to go in other places. So she kept fast, verse 23, by the maidens of Boaz, did lean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So she sticks in the field. She stays there till the end of the season. And it's interesting, just again, we see that she's, she's content to stay with her mother-in-law. She's content to labor in the fields and yet God is preparing the way for something much greater. She's no concept of what's coming, uh, but she's just, uh, just faithful to keep on keeping on doing the right thing, taking the advice of her mother-in-law, submitting uh, to her directions. And so this is what she does. And although the proverb is not written yet, uh, in a sense, what she's doing is doing what it says in in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. And that's certainly what she's doing. She's experiencing the truth of a verse that hasn't even been written yet, but she's, she's doing it and doing it well. So that leads us into chapter 3. Now, as we go into chapter three, just a kind of a, a recap of some of the things. Chapter one, we had leaving the far country. And that was a process of 10 years that was dealt with in chapter one. And chapter two, she's laboring in the field. And that was one very full day from early morning to late at night. Now we go to chapter three, and we're going to find her laying at his feet and it's going to be one eventful night leaving the far country laboring in the field laying at his feet we've <clears throat> seen many things uh, so far in the book we've thought about the people that we're dealing with different individuals key people we thought about the places uh, the field of boaz uh, we thought, thought about Bethlehem. We thought about Moab. We thought of God's providence in all of this and the principles that we can glean from this and the progress that we've seen in Ruth as a picture of a new convert and how she's progressed as a child of God. And so now we come to this amazing chapter, a nighttime, but a very special night. And we don't see other people so much in this chapter. It's, it's just because Naomi is the one that instigates it. But after Naomi instigates this, it's just Ruth and Boaz. They're the principal characters in this particular chapter. And, and uh, it, the, the, no mention of the overseer, no mention of the fellow laborers, no mention of the maidens as in previous chapters, but it's just a, a picture of Ruth in solitude with the Redeemer. And it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Sometimes it's good for us just to get alone at the feet of our Redeemer, just to be alone in his presence, just to enjoy him, uh, just to, no distractions, no one else there, just, just him and us. 
we at his feet, just enjoying his presence. And it's a wonderful place to be. And so in verses one through four, really Naomi is the main speaker, the main actor, and she's the one who takes the initiative here. She's had time to think about this as, as Ruth has continued to work in the field of Boaz to the very end of barley and wheat harvest. She knows that the time is now. This is the time now for something to happen. And so she takes the initiative. And so it says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, my daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee that it may be well with thee? And again, that's a good question, isn't it? Where, where do we find rest? Where's the place of rest? <laughs> the Lord Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Now, what does he say? You'll find rest for your souls, right? He's the place where we find rest. <clears throat> She's So far, Ruth has given much uh, up to accompany Naomi to Bethlehem. And for these several harvest months, She's toiled daily in the fields to support her mother-in-law. She truly cared for her mother-in-law and had been like a daughter to her. In fact, she calls her here, Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, <laughs> not daughter-in-law anymore, my daughter. She, her kindness to Naomi had been such, what she's saying is, like, you're better than a daughter to me. You have been so good to me. And so now after caring so much for a mother-in-law the mother-in-law says okay now it's my turn uh, to take care of you it's my turn to have your interests at heart and so she feels responsible for ruth's future welfare and makes known her mind and she says shall i not seek rest for thee and if you remember back in chapter one verse nine this rest uh, was <clears throat> connected to marriage in chapter 1, verse 9, the Lord grant that thou, uh, that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And, and the thought was in those days uh, that having a husband, he was a protector. He was a provider. And so he would give rest uh, to a wife. And, and certainly... It was a very vulnerable place to be a single woman in that culture and that society. Uh, and th there, was, there was lots of need for protection and need for provision because in their poverty, uh, they could be easily exploited. And so the marriage is meant to be a place of security and rest. And again, we, we need men to be men, to be the protector, to be the provider, uh, to, uh, to, to protect their wives uh, from, uh, from danger and harm. And again, I just I see that one of the, the great needs of our day is for men to be men. Uh, this whole concept of biblical manhood, taking our responsibilities. And that's what she wants, rest, security, uh, all that the marriage relationship can bring. And so this chapter, in one sense, it has great instruction for us practically on how to find rest. How do we find rest in, in, a, in a world that <clears throat> is very wearisome and it's a wilderness wide and it, and it can leave us jaded and it can leave us very frayed at the edges. And so where do we find rest? Well, the place we find rest is at the feet of our Boaz at the Lord Jesus, being prostrate at the feet of the Savior and leave everything with him. Uh, leave our cares at his feet. Say, you be my provider, my protector, the one that cares for me more than any. And, and of course, uh, he tells us to do that, doesn't he? Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. He's the one that can give us rest. So what... Naomi has in mind is in one sense going to affect both her and Ruth. It would secure Naomi's future because what it would do, it would, it would include the buying of her husband's inheritance, his land. And then it would secure Ruth's future 
because it would provide a husband and provide rest for her. Many of us know something of the rest of forgiveness. <laughs> you know, we know what it is uh, to uh, have no condemnation because of the saving work of Christ. But do we know the rest of peace in life's trials? And the thought is this, that if he can take care of our sin, he can take care of our burdens. He can give us rest. Can we lay our burdens down at the feet of the Lord Jesus and trust him to give us that daily rest? I find it interesting that it's easy for many of us to trust the Lord Jesus for our eternal destiny. And we seem to have that all down pat. We know we're saved. We know we're heaven bound. And I can trust him for all eternity. But can I trust him for today? Can I trust him for my daily bread? Can I trust, trust him for my, my daily encouragement? And so this is what this chapter speaks to, the idea of finding rest at the feet of the Savior. And this older believer is seeking to help a younger one to find uh, rest in the relationship with Boaz. And again, what a practical lesson for us, how, how we need to, having found rest at his feet ourselves, to encourage younger saints to deepen their relationship with the Lord Jesus, to, to learn what it is, the joys have been seated at his feet. We also are going to learn about how to make a request, the way she, she acts, uh, Ruth, in such a humble way, down on the floor, right in that place of humility at the feet of the Lord. And so lots of practical instructions to be found in this chapter. Notice verse 2, it says, And now is not Boaz of our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight, in the threshing floor. So not only does Naomi take the initiative, Naomi has intelligence. She knows she knows what's going on. Her, I guess you'd say her ear was close to the ground. And she knew that this night Boaz would be winnowing uh, on the threshing floor. And she made Ruth wise about this. She she told her. And, and there's, a, there's a kind of interesting background to all this. You see, the farmer, uh, usually during harvest time, would stay on the threshing floor, not only to protect his valuable grain, that was part of it, but also the winnowing process was something that he did himself. Others would be helping in the the cutting down of the sheaves the wrapping of the sheaves the binding of the sheaves but the the actual winnowing process was left to the to boaz or to the owner of the field it was performed in the evening to catch the breezes which would blow after the close of a hot day and it would continue most part of the night and so this duty was so important that the master undertook it himself. So Boaz, a person of considerable wealth and high rank, after he had completed the winnowing process, laid down to sleep on the floor at the end of the heap of barley that he had been winnowing to protect it. So <clears throat> she's reminded Naomi's reminding Ruth that Boaz, their family kinsman redeemer, their goel, that he would be winnowing at this particular evening. Now, we want to think a little bit about what was, what was the responsibility of this kinsman redeemer, this goel, Some, uh, sometimes translated as kinsman redeemer, here consistently as kinsman uh, in, uh, or kindred. Uh, what was his responsibility from scripture? And we want to just see four areas that he was responsible for. So let's go back to the Pentateuch to see these areas of his responsibility. Leviticus 25, to begin with in verse 48, 25 verse 48. 
we read this it says after that he is sold he may be redeemed again one of his brethren may redeem him and so the idea is that if some uh, someone uh, got into difficulty a uh, fellow israelite member of his family and was in slavery that a re kinsman redeemer would would buy him back out of slavery would redeem him from that position of slavery and again we think of our kinsman redeemer what has he done for us he's redeemed us from the slavery and the bondage of sin that's one thing that he did for us praise god that our lord jesus did that uh, back in numbers now another aspect of the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer in numbers 35 and verse 19 numbers 35 verse 19 close family member uh, it says <clears throat> the revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer then when he meeteth him he shall slay him and so he was to take the place of the role of the avenger of blood to make sure that that someone who had committed murder of a family member would answer for their crime and again we think of the lord jesus and <clears throat> he is not only buying us back from slavery but he is ultimately going to be the avenger of blood and he is going to deal with our enemy that has caused so much death and destruction satan and the lord is going to do that marvelous work and then Leviticus, please, chapter 25 and verse 25. Again, thinking of the map work of this kinsman redeemer, all the aspects of his different work. Leviticus 25, verse 25. If thy brothers be waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possessions, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So again, buying back family land that had been forfeited, uh, perhaps in times of hardship. And again, the Lord Jesus is going to restore uh, the land, uh, uh, again, that has been given over to the hand of the enemy. And of course, it certainly has its uh, fulfillment with the nation of Israel, particularly that he will give them back the land that was their inheritance. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and this is the one that pertains to our particular issue here deuteronomy 25 the idea of raising up a seed a progeny and so <clears throat> verse 5 it says if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which he beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother, which is dead, that his name be not be not put out of Israel. And if the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, my husband's brother refuseth to raise up unto his brother a name in israel he will not perform the duty of my husband's brother then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him and if he stand to it and say i like not to take her then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say so shall it be done unto the man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. And of course, that's going to have a great bearing when we get to chapter four. And we find that the nearer kinsman didn't want to take up the responsibility. And his shoe was taken off. We're going to see that fulfilled quite clearly. But certainly, <clears throat> the, the kinsman redeemer was responsible to safeguard the persons, the property, and the posterity of the family and so that was the responsibility of this kinsman the fundamental idea of fulfilling one's obligations as a kinsman and again we're very thankful 
that our Lord Jesus was willing to be the kinsman redeemer. And in order to be the kinsman redeemer, he took on flesh, right? A body has thou prepared me so that he might be the kinsman redeemer to us. And certainly he took up that wonderful place. So since Boaz was recognized as, a, as the Goel for the family of Elimelech, uh, the, the deceased husband of Naomi, the father-in-law of Ruth, Ruth could appeal to him to safeguard the posterity of Elimelech's family and take her in her marriage. It may seem very forward to us, you know, because usually the man is to be the pursuer, the man is to be the one that does the asking, but it was regarded as proper culturally in that day that she would appeal for him to take that role as kinsman redeemer. And the threshing floor was an interesting place, wasn't it? The threshing floor was the place of elimination. The chaff had to go. If we're going to really find rest, one thing that needs to be eliminated is chaff in our lives. But I noticed the clock here and our time has gone. And so we'll have to pick up the kinsman redeemer next time. May the Lord encourage us with the thought that we have a wonderful kinsman redeemer who came and willingly took us in and cared for us and blessed us. Amen.